task that we gave you, and I think you did a great job of, of pulling together some thoughts around the program. Um, so now I would like to ask the, the panel, can I, me puede poner la primera presentación otra vez? Gracias. Um, now I would like to ask the, the panel members to come up. Um, so we have invited uh, six people to help us get this discussion and dialogue started. Uh, Dr. Andrew Prentice from the Medical Research Council of Gambia. We've asked him, as you probably, those who you know Andrew, to represent uh, implementation science. Right? No, wrong. <laughs> Where you are. Clearly, we've invited Andrew to represent uh, the discovery science side of things. Sean Baker, the director of the nutrition team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We've asked him to represent a donor perspective. Bonnie McClafferty, Director of Agriculture and Nutrition at GAIN, to speak to us from the perspective of food systems and agriculture. Anthony Hare, uh, Director of the Nutrition Improvement Program at DSM. We're grateful for Anthony for filling in last minute. Um, for his colleague, we'll speak from the perspective of the private sector. Uh, Dr. Gonzalo Hernandez Licona is with the Consejo Nacional de Evaluación, which is the national council for evaluation. That is a, a body of the, of the federal government charged with evaluating social protection uh, or social programs. Um, and, uh, and we're very grateful for being here, Gonzalo. And then similarly, Jane Badham, who is a consultant and rep here, representative of the African Nutrition Leadership Program. Um, and thanks for stepping in also at the last minute, Jane. So I'm gonna ask each of you, um, maybe just starting, uh, Jane, since you're over there beside Lindsay, to give us a few reflections, comments, and then we'll open it up for questions after that. Oh, sorry, let me just say one more thing, sorry. Um, forgot to mention. We had sent the panelists some questions beforehand for them to reflect. So each of them can speak to all of these questions, can speak to one of them, and knowing them, some of them won't speak to them at all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lynette. Um, I might speak to some of them, none of them, or all of them in some other way. I really want to say that I think the important thing is that if we look at the SDGs, we've really set ourselves, as the world, ambitious goals. And in order to achieve them, I think it's absolutely essential that we're going to have to have change. And that change has got to happen at the individual level, you and me. It's got to happen at the institutional level, all the organizations, companies, groups that we come from, and it's also got to happen at the engagement framework level. And as I'm representing the African Nutrition Leadership Program, we really strongly believe that change has to be led, not managed. And very often in our fields, we're very good at management because we're either managing a program, we're managing a clinical study, but we aren't so good at the leadership component of what we have to do. So we would also continually say that as we go forward, we really need to recognize that. The Micronutrient Forum is without doubt a leader when it comes to the issues around micronutrients. And for that, and in leadership, we always say you have to have self-awareness, you have to have self-reflection, and you have to be open for feedback, positive or negative. So I really just want to, up front, thank the steering committee for taking this time to do exactly that. Self-reflection, being self-aware, and asking for the critical feedback. So I think. In that alone, we should give you a round of applause for what you've achieved. So I ask you, let's thank the steering committee. When you look at, uh, ask the question of what are the biggest challenges, certainly because I've been very involved throughout the conference in track four, I would really say I think one of the biggest challenges that remains is the language that we speak. And by that, I really think we have still got a long way to go to make sure that from the discovery, even through to the results of implementation, we actually have an ability to take those messages 
and transform them to be able to speak to a wide range of audiences. And in fact, just last night I was chatting to, to Roland from UNICEF and I was saying, I often think we think we've got one target audience and we actually have to break that down more and more. We can't just have one message. We need to say, who am I talking to? And then be very intentional about the language we speak actually reaching that person and that group. So I think that remains a major challenge for the forum with a huge diversity of topics, subjects, even things like anemia. We were having a discussion, what does it mean anemia really mean to a beneficiary or a policy maker? A starving child can easily be depicted. But how do you make the face of anemia truly touch a policymaker who has to make major decisions and look at where they're going to spend their budget? So we talk language very easily, but I don't think we're still translating it particularly well. Yesterday at a session where we talked exactly about this, I asked the room at the end of the session how many people would say we're doing a really good job at speaking the language that translates evidence into policies and programs. Not one hand in a full room went up. I said how many see the glasses half full? Still not one hand in the room went up. So we in self-reflection are also acknowledging that we aren't really at that point yet. I think just the one thing I do want to say, I'm going to skip to the, the question in, uh, and look a little bit at more. What could the Micronutrient Forum do more or differently? I also think yesterday after lunch's debate was absolutely fabulous to keep people awake after a long day but and engaged. So I think we can do much more of doing things in a different format. And I would really encourage us to do that. I would say a lot less presentations and much more dialogue. There was always time only for one or two questions because there are so, there's so much time for presentations. And I know it's, we've discussed it endlessly. It's a, a very hard balance to make. But I really want to encourage the Micronutrient Forum to be disruptive in the way they even do these kind of forums so that we have more of doing differently because I think that's going to be critical. So I think those are enough to get us started and I might come back to some other thoughts later. Thank you, Lynette. Thanks, Jane. Um, so it's quite hard to set up the microphone. Um, I think we should just keep going and then we'll come back. Okay, thanks, Lynette. Um, just to pick up on two things that Jane said before moving into some of the things I'd actually um, previously prepared about doing things differently. Um, what I really loved about the, the elevator pitch session, which was uh, the first of, of its kind here at the Micronutrient Forum, is it brought in this incredible sense of excitement, optimism, opportunity, healthy competition, about what the future might look like in delivering nutrition in very, very different ways. And uh, if you were there, the energy in the room was extremely exciting. And that lasts a long time. That sends people back into their countries and their communities with a certain sense of purpose to continue that discovery and continue refining these wonderful ideas. Because advancement is always built upon a constant supply of ideas that can truly be innovated and scaled. The other thing um, which I want to pick up from Jane is that as a, as a consumer, as a dietitian, and as a private sector member leading a business, Nutrition is a very complicated and complex topic. And we all take that for granted, I think, because we understand that there are some of the most brilliant minds in the room, and even on the panel here with me, who understand this topic really, really well in its complexity. But I think we also then have the responsibility to translate that complexity into something that is really relatable and understandable, indeed by those who have the money, to make those decisions and allocate budgets that we're so desperately asking for for nutrition, but also non-nutrition actors to get involved in this topic that we know can literally change the face of the world in a single generation if we get it right. 
And that's the, the power that's in this room, and that, that I hope challenges us to think about things differently. From the private sector perspective, what I love about this forum, and this is my fourth time uh, attending, and I was so delighted when I came back onto the scene when we all met in Ethiopia two years ago, is that it has evidence at its absolute core. It's built upon evidence, and the theme about discovery to delivery does true to that. I think this is one area that we absolutely have to rely on that evidence, and it, it needs to be unshakable. So it's built from that evidence at its core, and that allows industry to fully understand the process that gets followed from discovery to delivery. Because that in itself is quite complicated, so it does break it down for us. And it allows the needs of the community with whom we interact to be understood by us as well. It allows as well that the dialogue that we wish to have with academia, with governments, with policy makers, with implementers, it allows that dialogue to be strongly facilitated as well, which is important to build on growing trust with all these different segments and sectors in nutrition. It gives us a platform with which to engage with all of you. And lastly, and just to highlight again what I said earlier, is that it really, really sparks innovation, it sparks ideas, and it gives us the fuel to carry on for the next two years until we meet again, hopefully in two years' time. Just two things on what I might consider to uh, improve that would help us even more is um, we maybe don't conclude at the end of a particular session or a track and say, well, now so what? And I think Lindsay really highlighted that, that there are, we've had some wonderful discussions, there are a lot of things left open, but what are the key takeaways for us? What, what is our conclusion from each of the tracks, or what are our conclusions from the session? What does it mean for me in private sector in terms of product development and delivery? What does it mean in partnership working together to improve nutrition, whether it's on supplementation or a particular vulnerable group such as mothers or young children? And the other thing is, what is actually needed from the private sector and how best can we meet those needs? And I think you'd be surprised that um, we are extremely open to that discussion, uh, to understand what's expected from us and how we actually play a role. Instead of simply being a, a supplier called upon at the last minute to de develop and deliver something, when we think about bringing uh, the topic of rice fortification has been a big topic this week. Bringing rice fortification to scale requires massive commitment and, and investment from the private sector. So how can we best understand that so we can meet your demand with a supply of high quality, consistent fortified rice? And then lastly, delivery of nutrition requires so much more than the nutrition community. Those of us in the room are the choir. We've been converted, we can be preached to easily. How do we get non-nutrition actors involved in this discussion? Because I really believe the return on investment has been proven beyond any benefit of a doubt to be up there among the highest in the world of any social development intervention. That gives us the biggest opportunity. And how can we find non-nutrition actors, whether they're celebrities or non-nutrition companies, the Nikes of the world, the Vodafones of the world, to see this as the best investment because you get nutrition right and you create a future consumer base tomorrow. And that's good for the entire world. I have other comments, but I'll leave them for later. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm the Aggie at the panel, I think. Yeah. Um, and so, Lindsay, um, Lindsay, your introduction was great. Let me first thank both the steering committee and Bravo Lynette um, for organizing yet again a, a wonderful um, forum. Um, I have a few, just a few observations. If I were to place myself in that continuum, I am clearly a program on the programming end. And if I were to say, did or were we successful in that translation? I would say we're getting there. Um, I was fully prepared to come to this meeting and say, okay, now I'm going to have to understand that medical model again. Um, and absolutely critical and doing the translation myself. So there is still this gap in how we translate. Um, but I have to tell you, I was really looking to see how much food has come on the agenda. And initially, I was thinking, once again, it's, we're going to be talking about individual micronutrients and very interesting research. Um, but I play in the world where people are not eating nutrients and they're not even eating a single crop. 
were eating diets. And this is what's having an impact on micronutrient status from, from our perspective. So I thought that for a moment I would take a look at what happened in Ethiopia in terms of where food and diets were on the agenda and then where we are today with this forum. And when I looked at all of the abstracts and the, sen and the special sessions and the plenaries, um, in Ethiopia, the plenaries, the concurrent sessions and the learning centers had about four places where food and diets were quite apparent. Good news, here it was 11. But from my perspective, the richness and perhaps the harbinger for the next forum is in those posters. The posters were incredibly informative if you were able to get the time. And when I put that agriculture, food, and diet lens on the posters, in Ethiopia, there were about 63 of the posters that focused on foods and diets and food systems and the food environment. Here, you have 86. And I know they were pre-selected along the tracks, but this is telling you, food is here. It's here, diets are here. So the extent to which we need to bring them in, yes, continue, but many of our colleagues in the room, all of these minds are saying, these micronutrients exist within foods and food systems. So I, for one, am very encouraged that we can bring in a much larger community to this. Um, and I guess I would pose a question back to the audience on how much we actually want to encourage the multi-dimension of what, bring, what, what one looks at when you bring in the food system. Um, I would, of course, encourage us to do so. Um, and we've got the whole food science community. Um, agriculture, of course, now biofortification, of course, is incredibly well represented here. Um, over the years, um, the evidence that has come from that team is phenomenal and um, needs to be celebrated. But we still don't have a very good handle on the food matrix. What are promoters and inhibitors doing? How do we bring together better product to have optimizing diets for the populations we're working in that are accessing foods through markets and are eating whole diets? So um, I would, but I would throw that back to the crowd to see perhaps how much they want to continue that. Um, I think in terms of one of the questions we have is how do we overcome some of these challenges? Um, and from my perspective, the challenge is really bringing in the agriculture and food system more. Um, it could be so simple as looking at your, even your branding. If I were an Aggie and I saw the Micronutrient Forum, I'd be saying to myself, okay, I think I have a role there, but perhaps a tagline that says, looking from food all the way, you know, there's something in the tagline that could help attract a larger group. It's a simple suggestion, but it's a suggestion. Um, in turn, one, one item I think, I think will probably come up is, when we look at a program for the forum, I think our tendency is to say, I'm a zinc specialist, so I'm gonna go to zinc, 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 zinc. You know, like, you know an, ag an agricultural analogy might be, you know, I'm a bee, but I only, only like clover. And I'm gonna go to white clover and red clover, but I'm gonna stay in clover. In fact, we need to be able to stretch and find a mechanism where we stretch outside of our individual areas. And I think you can do that. You could look at other sectors that do this um, um, in, in other scientific sectors. Um, and so, if my final comment is around collective impact and how do we at the forum generate an environment for collective impact, um, that it's not just the zinc specialists who are going to be successful and then the iron specialists, etc. but collectively we have a common goal and we push each other to a common goal. I'm wondering if the forum could be a place to do that. Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity, and I'd like to first echo others here of, to really extend my deep gratitude to the International Committee, the, uh, the International Steering Committee, the Local Organizing Committee. I just found the menu options on, during the last six days incredibly enriching. Um, and I think that they've really helped broaden the tent, uh, as others have spoken to to do so, broaden the tent both in terms of content area and people and talent we're drawing into this, if I compare it to other 
I bags, I nags, I zincs, micronutrient form. So I think that is wonderful. And just to give a vignette of the energy, uh, Sunday morning, sunny beach in Cancun, but we were in this one session starting at 8.30 in the morning, competing with the Jehovah, Ho Jehovah Witnesses uh, downstairs. And, you know, people engaged totally in discussing the data and evidence ecosystem. It was really, and I think it's been that spirit of energy and engagement throughout this whole six-day extravaganza. I know it's been a real labor of love for the people pulling this together. So really, really warm thanks and congratulations. Um, Lindsay, you did a great job of summarizing. So, and then Lynette, fortunately, gave license up front to ignore some of the questions. So I, I was actually going to start at a different level because I was reflecting after this six-day extravaganza of, of, you know, how was I feeling about this forum after really six intense days? And I really have three conflicting sets of feelings. <clears throat> so I start feeling very galvanized, but I also feel very sobered, uh, and I also feel very haunted. And I was going to expound a bit on each of those. Um, on the galvanized side, and I usually lead with being quite excited, you know, I think if we look at nutrition beyond just micronutrients, we have achieved this community level of awareness for decision makers that's been unprecedented, at least in my lifetime. Uh, just to give some examples, uh, last year when Bill Gates was asked if he could use a magic wand to solve any one global health problem, his answer was malnutrition. Just 12 days ago in Abidjan, the president of the African Development convened the first, champion, first meeting of the Champions Group of the African Leaders for Nutrition. And this is one of his taglines, but what he said in Abidjan was that uh, the need to, in gray matter infrastructure is the most important infrastructure that we need to build in Africa. The former president of Ghana, John Kufour, was there, and he stated the most basic infrastructure of all is the brain. Further north of here, just a few days ago, we know the World Food Prize was awarded to the vision of bringing nutrients into crops is one way to address vitamin and mineral deficiency. We know two of those laureates have been here with us all week. Audi Jan, warm congratulations, and also to Maria and Robert who are not here. I mean, that's a level of visibility of leadership we've never had. But then I'm also sobered because I think, I was thinking, well, you know, we actually had some moments in the sun before, uh, and I, did a Google search just to make sure I wasn't wrong, and I went back to 1990, World Seventh of Children brought together, I believe, 71 heads of state and government. And if you go back and you look at those nutrition goals and targets, they were incredibly ambitious, and including for micronutrients, they called for virtual elimination of vitamin A deficiency, virtual elimination of iodine deficiency, and reducing anemia by one-third, and not by 2030, by 2000. We clearly did not make it. And, you know, that's why uh, I think, writ large, this environment for nutrition is probably about as good of any of us in our lifetime have seen. But success is not guaranteed. Uh, we could still snatch defeat from the jaws of this opportunity. And that's what leads me to say being haunted. Um, there is a particular quote that I've used from Nelson Mandela before that haunts me. And he was reflecting on the Millennium Development Goals. And he queried, will our generation's legacy be more than a series of broken promises? And here collectively in this plenary room today, we really are the stewards of the incredible promise. You know, we have more knowledge, more tools, and more political will than we've ever had before. Uh, and so, we in this room shoulder the immense responsibility of seizing this moment in time, of ensuring the world does not break the nutrition promises in China and in the sustainable development goals. So, those are really the reflections which were framing my thoughts about the micronutrient forum going forward. Um, and people have, other people have spoken to the need to broaden our tent. Uh, 
uh, and I sense really during this forum a broadening of the tent. Uh, and I think it's a, tent, a trend that we need to uh, be continuing very purposely, including very purposely culti cultivating the next generation of nutrition leadership from research, upstream development, through advocacy, through implementation. And it was, I've spoken to several colleagues, uh, for those of us who've been around the block a bit longer than we would like to admit to, it was really nice to walk into Cancun and see how many people in the room I did not know. I think that's really refreshing of bringing a new talent uh, and a new generation of leadership. I particularly like the debate on the micronutrient powders, others referred to it, and it's not just because I hold Stan, Omar, and Marie in such high esteem, but I think it was a beautiful illustration of exactly what this forum should serve, to be a space where we can have evidence-based debates around really thorny issues among ourselves as a community, and then take the next step and say, and this is where we think we should go now, and let that be our outward-facing message. Um, and I think it also reflects a way where we have to be more nimble as a nutrition community writ large and as a micronutrient community specifically. Uh, and in fact, Lindsay, you captured a lot of this in your reflections. And I, re I often compare it because I used to have a parallel life on the technical review panel of the Global Fund. And I often was struck by things in the HIV community that we should take lessons from. And I think that in nutrition and micronutrients specifically, we need to be more nimble. Um, to be very provocative and unfair, I would characterize as that in nutrition, we want to have perfect evidence before making policy. We've often treated policy as that it's sacrosanct, it's carbon stone forever, uh, and that we've treated, uh, and that we want the policy to be global. Well, it's interesting in HIV just how much, how quickly, uh, there was a willingness to issue guidance on, okay, this is the best we can do right now, but we understand that guidance will change. It has to change. And we have to continually update guidance, but don't create an expectation that this is the way it will be forever. And also, there was a big revolution in HIV with this under the slogan of know your epidemic, know your response. So both to drive much better context understanding before you do, to drive designing your programs, and also apply rigor to the way you design your programs, but then also the way you monitor it and feed that back. Um, and then another that I think we need to continue to learn from is the way the HIV community had used the sense of outrage. I often reflect back to the 2008 uh, Lancet series, the, the chapter that diagnosed the global nutrition system as broken was great. It accused us of not playing well together and many other sins, which were mainly evidence-based. But I think, in a way, we become too well-behaved. You know, it's absolutely outrageous that so many lives are lost today, 2016, because of micronutrient malnutrition, and so many lives are fundamentally undermined because of micronutrient malnutrition. And we need to make sure we channel that outrage constructively. And Joel Spicer referred to a very fruitful weekend in Ottawa, the Global Fund Replenishment that brought $14 billion to the table for HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. But what he didn't do is, is explain, in fact, that has been an incredible work in the making for many, many years, channeling the outrage, very savvy understanding the political economy, very defined asks of what they need, and very smart use of advocacy. And I think that we can learn a lot from that. Um, and then the know your response, and that's where I think I really applaud the move into uh, the, the, the move into implementation science because I do think that we can be more purposeful in forging these relationships between implementers and researchers to apply that same rigor to the science of how is what we've been applying to the science of what. So. Um, I really, again, just wanted to thank the, the opportunity to speak and then thank the organizers. Thank you. Well, I'd like to start off by obviously uh, making the same comments and thanking the organizers, and, and particularly perhaps for inviting the left field person, the discovery person. 
And so my comments, I'm, I'm going to restrict my comments because I have that opportunity. I'm very grateful that you've, you've selected me as, as a discovery scientist. And I, I want to reflect on, on some ways that we perhaps can help. So there has been discovery at this meeting. I've only been here for half of it, incidentally, so I can't speak to the first half, but obviously I've been through the program. There's been some discovery, but I, I wish there were more. Now, how can I substantiate that statement? Lindsay ended her presentation saying, we need to move faster. How are we going to move faster? By going backwards to discovery in order to move forwards again. Why are you, Andrew, living and working in the middle of the African bush, doing some very basic science? Don't you know all the answers? Shouldn't we just be getting on? Devising the policy, implementing the policy. And what I've sensed at this meeting, and I don't know whether others of you share this, but I've sensed a, a, a great feeling of unease. Lindsay, you brought this out a bit, how we're self-questioning and things. But I, you know, I've seldom been to a meeting that has actually been as uneasy with itself as, I've, as, as this meeting. And I don't know whether that's fair comment or not, and I'd be interested to see if others of you have felt it. So I'd like to try and make two little examples to try to persuade those of you who are unpersuaded as to what the discovery science can add and how that can be taken forward by the micronutrient form. The first little example, and they're both unashamedly based on our own work, but, but I'm doing that because you know, I've trodden a long road over many years thinking how best to do the science that can contribute to developing better next generation intervention. So two examples from our work. The first is a plea to open the aperture. Micronutrient forum is based almost exclusively on vitamin A, iron and zinc so far. Now of course we have the multiple micronutrient powders, but I've only heard the word riboflavin mentioned once since I've been here. And that was a kind of throwaway as part of the parcel of micronutrient. Riboflavin deficiency is by far the most common deficiency in most of sub-Saharan Africa. We don't mention it. Why do we not mention it? Now let me tell you why we should mention it. So we've been doing some research looking at how people, people's diets that are affected by seasons, so coming back to the foods, how seasonal changes in diet of the mother have a profound effect on their baby's epigenome, depending on whether that baby is conceived in the hungry season or the harvest season. Now, are we just playing around with the epigenetics and finding some little changes in CPG methylation? No. We've now already published that these changes would appear to have a significant effect on tumor suppressor genes, susceptibility to viral infection, and your likelihood or not of becoming obese. Now, the drivers of this methylation are a complex constellation of nutrients that don't actually include vitamin A, iron, or zinc at all. They're the B vitamins, they're betaine, choline, and it is my contention, and we, we have some even more exciting work that I'm not at liberty to share yet, but it's my contention that if we could learn how all these mechanisms work, we could make some profound changes to the nutrition of future generations and to breaking the intergenerational cycle. So that's a plea to open up the aperture, and I don't know whether that would resonate with the forum because actually they've got quite enough work already, but to open up our aperture and try to really understand how micronutrients could have a beneficial effect. Let me end by giving a very specific example, because I, I work in iron also, as you know. We're in a mess, quite frankly. We really don't know what to do, and when we think we know what to do, it often doesn't achieve the ends that we want to achieve. Now, I think, as a basic scientist, I can explain that, and I'll try and do that in the next 60 seconds or so. So, as nutritionists, I think most of us still hold on to this view that the good Lord, or evolution, has designed people very badly. Children are very poor at absorbing iron. And therefore we need to help them. We need to throw micronutrients at them. We need to throw iron in an easily absorbable way. 
and make sure that they get tons and tons of it. Now actually, basic science in the last 15 years has come up with the lovely molecule hepcidin. Who of you knows, who of you works in iron? Put your hands up. And how many of you, put your hands, keep your hands up if you could explain to me the hepcidin cycle. And be careful, I might call you out on this. Okay, we've got, we've got two or three hands left up. This is absolutely crucial. Let me explain why. These children are not badly absorbed, uh, designed to absorb iron. They are intentionally fighting to keep iron out of their system. We now understand very clearly why that is the case and how that is the case. And to give you just the latest of uh, uh, data that's come out of our work, I don't know if Rita Wengler is still in the audience, but what we're finding is that hepcidin shuts down iron absorption even at extremely low levels of inflammation. So the message here is, is very clear. Our interventions are not working because these kids are inflamed. This doesn't have to be about malaria or overt diseases. It's about the low-grade inflammation. What is the policy implication of that? The policy implication is that we need to be in what we call nutrition sensitive. So this is the wash, but beyond wash to much more intensive changes. Now that sounds like bad news. That's not nutrition and it's never going to be achieved. But actually I see it as very good news. I think once we start to understand this and we can correct these things, then all of our nutritional interventions will really work. So I see it as actually very positive. But it's that insight which we, we couldn't have 20 years ago before we discovered hepcidin. But now I think I at least, and a few others who work in this field of hepcidin, have a very clear view as to why these interventions aren't working. And we need to then follow that up and bring that into the implementation science and the policy. And, if, and, and so that's just one vignette. There are many other examples that one could bring up. But what I'm trying to do is to make the pitch for discovery science and say that uh, it actually can accelerate. It's a bit of the hare and the tortoise. Uh, scenario that actually if we get back to the drawing board and understand really what's going on, we will actually ultimately advance faster. So that's my plea for Discovery Science and once again I'm very grateful for you to have me here. Thank you very much Andrew. Uh, it's been really interesting for me to be here today and yesterday and witness all this gathering, big gathering of people so, so, so bright, exchanging and communicating um, and that's essential for, for bridging knowledge and action. Um, so we need to have the same room implementa implementators, producers of, producers of knowledge, uh, point of view of households, civil society, policy makers. I think policy making is an art. So I think the, the art of, policy, of efficient public, public policy is this vicious circle of effective communication. So I think we have to, you have to congratulate yourself for this um, very important forum. Uh, in the middle of that, I do have like four suggestions specifically. Uh, unfortunately, most of them have been said by my friends here. <laughs> and that's the, uh, but I'm going to insist in, 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 in this suggestion. First of all, uh, as Anthony was saying, all of us who are here, we are believers in what we do. We believe in the, in the, in the bridge between knowledge and um, public policy. Uh, so, fortunately, we understand most of the, most of the elements. If we have policymakers here, then we are believers in that. The challenge here is how can we invite to this forum non-believers? How can we invite people who are the ones who are going to implement what we say? Because unfortunately, those who want to change, those who are going to change the world, perhaps we are not here, there. unfortunately they are outside. So we need to convince them. I'll give you an example. I wonder if we have here people from, from the health ministry of the state of Quintana Roo, for instance. I wonder if there's someone here around. And I understand that the secretary of, or the ministry of, of health is going to be here but only for the picture. <laughs> it's going to close the ceremony and all that. And so that was very good. Okay. The challenge is, how can we convince a person like him 
to take notes of what we're saying here and then put it um, and try to do public policy. And the second, therefore, the second uh, suggestion is <laughs> linked to the other one is how can this forum, how can we link much better the political incentives of policymakers and knowledge and science? Because I think I've been working on evaluation for the past 15 years and I came from academia and I was a bit naive at the beginning, I'm still out of it, but uh, saying, well, I produced this extraordinary paper on economic, my field is economics, on this element of poverty and inequality. And, and I think it's such a great paper that the Minister of Finance is going to read it and is going to implement it. Wrong. And the President is going to read it and implement it. Wrong. Why? Well, because the President and the Ministry and the Minister and the, and the Minister, when they wake up every morning, they don't read our papers on nutrition or economics. They are thinking about the next election and they are thinking about other elements. So the art of convincing policymakers is how can we link those incentives with our knowledge? So I'm going to tell you in a second our experience in Mexico, but let me just finish with my suggestions. Of course, the third one, as, as Jane was saying, is the language. I will also believe that this beautiful regression that you have R square uh, is going to be real readable for, for our friend in, at the Ministry of Social Protection, and it's not. How can we translate, especially economies that we are, <laughs> we believe that we are so clear how the way we speak, and it's not true. <laughs> so how can we translate our findings into the minds of policymakers? Um, and of course, the fourth one is, is timing. According to where, when are we delivering the information, they, that information, even for a bright politician, can be used by now, or perhaps it's too late because the government is about to finish. So, so, so those are my four elements, and perhaps uh, this forum can help. But let me just give you very briefly, because I can talk about this for the next four hours. That so. As you witness, Mexico is, still has huge challenges. Um, high poverty, high uh, extreme poverty and employment, uh, still on nutrition, uh, because Mexico is, is, is beyond Co Co Cancun. Cancun is very nice in Mexico. <laughs> it's more homogeneous than Cancun. Even the state of Quintana Roo, you have poor people and people undernourished here in, in Quintana Roo a lot, just near Cancun. Uh, however, Unfortunately, the poverty and undernutrition has been going down, and it coincides a lot with these efforts we made starting in 1997 and, and beyond that, where we produce some evidence in the program that you are, you know, this Progresa, and then our milk program in Gonza, and then our food program, in where we try to link evidence and try to convince policymakers to do it. And on, because of that, we built for, for social policy a very interesting evaluation, monitoring, and monitoring system in, where, in which we have a various incentives for policymakers there, both positive incentives and negative incentives, because we need both to convince policymakers. For instance, we have we public all our information in programs and not only nutrition programs and other programs, and when we find out that a policymaker is using that information, we, we make it public and we even give them an award, an award of using public policy. And it is a very interesting award. I mean, I wouldn't believe at the beginning that it's going to be so successful that in front of the press, you have the Minister of Health or the Minister of Social Development receiving an award from, from Corneval, that's where I work, which is, we are the ones uh, setting up the, the evolution system, so they are really happy to have an award of using that evidence, but at the same time, we publish in, in our web, pipe, web page when the information from them was not delivered to be published, and therefore they, they see themselves, um, and the press see themselves, they're publishing 
the, the good and the bad things. So I think this is a very good example uh, of how can you how can you go also beyond beyond what you do, which is what you do is extraordinary, to have all these all these uh, both positive and, and, and sometimes negative incentives for policymakers. Um, and if that doesn't work, then we can have the singing as the Jehovah Witnesses. We can sing as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that was so rich discussion that there's no way I'm going to try to summarize or anything like that. Um, but I do want to pick up on two points before we move into the discussion uh, and the questions and, and comments from everyone. And that's, I'm going to steal Sean's what I'm encouraged about and what I'm worried about, or, or what haunts me. So I'm encouraged because I heard across all of the comments that we are spot on in our focus of bridging discovery and delivery, in, this, in the need for it and in the, and the, the critical importance um, and the filling a gap that nobody else is doing. And I think, Andrew, you made such a great point. Everybody across this week has been in the talking about the importance of understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it, and, and you know, in addition to the how. And you've made a very good plea for the fact that implement, uh, basic science has to come in there in our, in our understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it, and, and we often you know, if we're going to move beyond the doing the same things on forever, we have to come back to that. So I, I'm very encouraged, and I think we're on the right track there, along with all of the caveats that uh, Bonnie and others have raised, that maybe we haven't fully spanned that, we haven't got all of the people that we need here making that bridge for discovery to delivery, but the focus is where it should be. But I'm worried, and you brought this point up for me, I'm worried about how many people are here, not only from Mexico, but from Latin America. If you go to the Latin American Society of Nutrition, which is every three years, there's anywhere from three to 5,000 people actively working in nutrition in the Latin American region. And frankly, I thought that we would have a fuller hall here of all of that incredibly rich community from Latin America that is working on the topic of nutrition. So what went wrong there? And I think I heard a few things there. I think we may have a branding problem because we are micronutrients. And frankly, nutrition in Latin America isn't necessarily, even though there's still a great need, there's also such an incredible need around the problems of overweight and obesity that there's a bit of a shift in the focus of the, the nutrition community towards overweight and obesity. But we've also heard that micronutrients are critically important in the agenda around, around overweight and obesity because of their link with nutrition and, and history of nutrition and early nutrition, um, because of the fact that often um, having inflammation related to overweight and obesity is going to influence the quality of the biomarkers, so do we even understand our prevalence in this region of, of, of micronutrient malnutrition in, in, the, in a population that has such a high prevalence of overweight and obesity? So we should have been able to bring them here, but something went wrong. Do the, and is it a branding issue? Is it a, is it a communications issue? Is it a, you know, just too much competition and too many other nutrition meetings that, that, that we're competing with? Yeah, maybe they were downstairs on the first floor and the Jehovah's was witnesses, who knows? Um, but somehow we need, to, we need to make sure that we are able to engage, and particularly because in that case, a lot of those people Slanting, slant attracts an enormous uh, young, early career uh, cohort. And here, we, somebody, I, I, I think that was Klaus at the gala dinner, asked everyone who was under 35 to raise their hand. And it was a pretty, pretty sadly small cohort of people who were able to raise their hand, except those of us who like to lie about our age, but that doesn't count. So somehow we have to attract younger people. We need to get people motivated and interested and not think of micronutrients as the, as the old school of all of those old people that used to talk about that and those problems of undernutrition only and our agenda, you know, we've resolved those problems, we need to move on. And I think, you know, we, we've been 
thinking about that in this region right now, but the whole world is going through a problem, or an epidemic of overweight and obesity, and there's a, there's a maybe there's a, a lesson here to be learned as well from this region that, that the problems of, of micronutrient malnutrition don't go away just because you also now have this growing problem of overweight and obesity. They're not, uh, in, in increasing one, you haven't necessarily resolved the other. So we need to, we need to speak to that community as well. We need to keep the relevance of our agenda. Okay, so that's just a, a few reflections. We have uh, about 20 minutes uh, or so for, for discussion, for comments, input, and so please,